Jack Chen. I'm a historian at New York University, and I'm delighted to be interviewing Noam Chomsky today. Uh, we will be discussing Asian American and Pacific Islander issues, uh, both in terms of the growing numbers of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States, and many of them are at our college campuses, but also especially focusing on issues of race, uh, its relationship to foreign policy, intercultural kinds of questions, and also questions of uh, philosophy and education. So, um, so Noam, uh, I was, uh, you know, I thought it'd be useful to maybe contextualize a little bit. Um, it, you know, I'm sure at MIT, but certainly at NYU and places like Stony Brook here, there are a lot of Asian American students, and many of them are coming as. Uh, you know, the children of recent immigrants. Um, Korean Americans have a term for it, 1.5ers, uh, 1.5 generation. And it's my understanding that also you're, you, you could be, I don't know if you would consider yourself that way, but in many ways you're the child of immigrants um, mm -hmm. and you spoke, uh, did you speak Yiddish? Uh, no, my no. parents refused to let us speak Yiddish. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's um, for different reasons, however. Okay. That's because there was a, uh, in the Jewish immigrant community, there was kind of a kulturkampf going on at the time between uh, a Yiddish diaspora-oriented and Hebrew, then Palestine-oriented. Right. My parents were on that side. Of course, there was other whole groups that just wanted to drop it all. You know. Right. Right. So you spoke Hebrew then. My, I was. I didn't actually speak it, but it was in a Hebrew culture. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Learned it. Right. You know. Right. Well, one of the interesting questions about being a 1.5er is that uh, people have some insight about more than one culture. Mm -hmm. um, they're immersed in a family culture and also a community, oftentimes a community culture, which has its food ways, languages, uh, mm -hmm. still immersed in, in that kind of very different, oftentimes immigrant you know, experience. And then they're also engaged with various aspects of kind of the dominant U.S. culture. and. Um, so, so part of what I think is very interesting now about Asian Americans who are in this country is that they're kind of negotiating that. Uh, Korean Americans in particular have talk, talked about being caught between cultures. Uh, but it seems to me that that's also a resource of special insight, really, mm -hmm. critical insight about the cultural difference and, um, and how cultures operate and what the norms of different cultures are. I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that, that well, but, yeah. it depends very much how it's treated. Right. I mean, it can be a way of enriching a uh, society and a culture, or, uh, or it can be abandoned. Many immigrant communities have tried to uh, uh, suppress and abandon their traditional roots and Americanize themselves. I mean, I remember that very well in childhood, in fact. Went in both directions. My parents were really transplanted immigrant community, happened to be here. Uh, but uh, my generation uh, was trying to Americanize itself in every way. Uh -huh. Could you, was there something of, of an idea of an American dream in, 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 yeah, within that? It was that, more or? a matter of learning baseball statistics and making sure you were you know, as uh, like the other kids, you know, and even more, more so than they were. At the same time, keeping to, you know going to Hebrew school in the afternoon and so on and so forth. So it's kind of two parallel universes, right. which was pretty common of Jewish kids back in the 30s and the 40s. Right. I'm wondering if that's I mean, part of the reason for that was there was plenty of anti-Semitism. It was rife, so you just wanted to, uh, you sort of wanted to keep your identity not too visible. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you wanted to kind of become American in terms of identifying identifying with baseball. Well, like the be part of the yeah. kids on the street. Right, right, yeah. Um, I, there are, I, I kind of want to share with you maybe a few people that I've been working with and because I think their experiences in some ways embody the tension of being caught between different cultures and also uh, clearly what happens in Asia has affected them deeply here, uh, but it's also a process of discovering what those meanings yeah. are. Um, last night at the event, uh, I met a man who is in his 50s. He's Filipino-American. Uh, his father uh, was in the Philippines, a supporter of Marcos. He himself 
um, was drafted during the Vietnam War and fought in the war, and uh, started dealing with the fact that he wasn't uh, kind of a mainstream uh, American in the sense that uh, soldiers were, American soldiers were starting to uh, threaten him and mm -hmm. call him racist names. Uh, so he, he was telling me that he not only had to kind of watch out who was in front of him, but also watch behind his back. Um, that's one story. Um, the other story is a, a PhD student of mine who's Vietnamese, and um, she was just finishing up her PhD a couple years ago when it was discovered that she had ovarian cancer. And it turns out that a lot of Vietnamese children who came over in... She's South Vietnamese. She's South Vietnamese, yeah. Could be uh, chemical warfare. Effect. Were affected yeah. by dioxins, yeah, and yeah. that it's affected um, the children, even though they may have been quite young when they left mm -hmm. um, in a profound no, way. No, there's still new cases coming along yeah. from new, uh, children born well after the uh, chemical warfare was terminated. Actually, there's extensive studies of it, but they can't be reported here. Or they won't be, they aren't reported at least. Many of them done by uh, American uh, public health specialists. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was just a conference in uh, Hanoi uh, a couple of months ago in which uh, a leading uh, U.S. Uh, uh, researcher who's concerned with uh, dioxin uh, did a, reported an extensive study that they had done uh, comparing dioxin. It's, it's only in South Vietnam that they didn't use it in North Vietnam, so kind of ugly, but they have a control population. The, uh, 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 he just compared the levels of dioxin with uh, uh, levels of spraying, and of course it coincided closely, but he also found that dioxin levels were hundreds of times as high as what's permitted here in heavy spraying areas. Actually, Columbia University just published a, a, a unit in the epidemiological uh, center I just published a study in Nature, you know, the British Science Journal, a couple of weeks ago, in which they discovered that uh, the actual use of um, these chemicals was about 50 percent higher than what was reported. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and there's extensive uh, studies of the effects. So there's new cases coming along. It's kind of, and uh, here, there's virtually no mention of it. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, yeah, which is, you know, you don't pay attention to your own crimes. You know. Right, right. Yeah, it's, what's interesting about these two examples, um, but also there are many more that we could go on and on, is that these are people who have been deeply affected by war, violence, U.S. foreign policy. When they come here, they're also racialized in very particular ways. They mm -hmm. oftentimes are pro-Marcos or South Vietnamese and came, you know, with the support of the U.S. But then in this country, they're they're kind of treated in. Uh, well, they're uh, that they're both, I and mean, especially the Philippines, because it goes back a century. But uh, the Philippines were very deeply colonized, mm -hmm. um, to the extent that sense of identity was lost mm -hmm. uh, in many respects. And they have to kind of recover what they have to learn what happened to them. Uh, Vietnam is more complex because of more recent than. Uh, Many different currents and so on, but uh, I mean, take even support for Marcos. I mean, the U.S. Uh, he, he was a brutal, corrupt dictator. Uh, the Reagan Bush administration not only supported him, but uh, expressed what they called their love for him and their his. They admired his love for democracy, uh, George Bush Sr. and so on, and that went on up to the practically the day when the military turned against him. I um, mean, there was a, what they called people's power movement, the, which kind of sp you know, spread over much of the country. And, uh, but the military, which was very powerful, was pressing it. At one point, I think it was about, uh, I think it was around March 1984, if I remember, the military turned against him, and the Reagan administration instantly turned against him. Uh, and they said, yeah, we support the democratizing forces, but uh, so, so uh, and then they became anti-Marcos. Yeah. So people like that are caught in a very complicated situation in which they grew up with the support of the United States, supporting a dictator, part of the dictatorial system, but then became quickly on the other side when policy shifted almost overnight. And of course, the racial element is just constant, no matter what side you're on. Right, right. The Vietnamese case is 
complex if this is a South Vietnamese woman. Uh, you know, she was probably, you know, South Vietnam was split. Uh, uh, there was a U.S. client regime with its own supporters, and uh, there was a, uh, a popular movement that was opposing it in the South. So it's kind of like uh, France during the German occupation. I mean, Vichy France had plenty of supporters. It was running the country pretty much by itself with the Germans in the background. Uh, the resistance had plenty of supporters. And in fact, after the war, there were uh, pretty serious reprisals. Uh, thousands of people killed. You know. right, right. So that's, that's pretty common in countries that are colonized. Part of, um, I think, the challenge of uh, Asian American studies and that perspective that brings to, let's say, American studies and American history is that you have uh, people who have migrated here who come out of these experiences. And obviously, people don't necessarily critically reflect on their experiences. Some of them are escaping and just kind of trying to assimilate and acculturate yeah. as quickly as possible. But uh, in their backgrounds, I mean, what's interesting about this Filipino-American man is that he didn't really think about his identity, even after having been in Vietnam uh, and having had the experiences he had, until he had grandchildren. Mm. And then he began thinking about what was he going to tell his grandchildren? What, what identities? Uh, well, what did were, he know about Philippine history? Well, they, Probably not so much. It's not much, quick. right. Because yeah. right. it was wiped out in right. the colonial experience, virtually wiped out. I mean, it was kept in some circles, of course. Right. But uh, for much of the population, it was just suppressed. Many of the Filipinos that I work with talk about the absence of presence, the yeah. absence of presence. And part of the challenge of doing the kind of educational and historical work they do is to try to, try to make something tangible and real because it's all been wiped out. The archives mm -hmm. are gone. The stories are kind of suppressed. People mm -hmm. don't talk about them. It's true everywhere. I and mean, take, say, Korea. Uh, as K South Korea is becoming democratized, uh, it's also bringing up uh, 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 memories of things that happened earlier which had been suppressed, mm -hmm. uh, like the Jeju Island Massacre, which was never discussed for years. Uh, but now it's a big issue on the island. They have conferences every year. Uh, they're trying to, and it's spreading through the population what happened. Uh, you know, these issues, they, they, it gets suppressed for a long time. Actually, I noticed this a uh, number of places. I, I happened, in Europe, I happened to have Gone. Well, I did go to uh, both Spain and uh, Greece shortly after the dictatorships were overthrown. Yes. And uh, the young people just had no idea what the background was. I mean, if you, uh, years later, it's beginning to come out. But uh, if you talked about you know, what happened in Barcelona in 1939, I mean, I remember it vividly, but only people my age New. Same in Greece, talk about the Greek Civil War. People my age remembered, but hadn't talked about it for years because you just couldn't talk about those things. And their children didn't know. You know. So you have to kind of recover a history which is not that far back in these cases. Same in Vietnam. Yeah, one of my students um, was taking one of our courses and was reading a history book and uh, and there was a reference to it. I think it was a Bruce Cummings uh, history, and, uh, and Chejudo was mentioned. Mm. And she suddenly realized that because her family was from Chejudo and her grandfather had disappeared and died at a certain point, that mm. that was what had happened. Yeah. Is that you know it was a very powerful insight. But the family itself didn't talk Did, about it. No, didn't you make don't talk about those things. Yeah. But I mean, I remember it from my own childhood. My parents never talked about Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Actually, my mother was too young, but my father was there until he was 17. Mm -hmm. you know? But it was just one of those things you didn't talk about. So part of the, the, the kind of irony or um, difficulty of being a migrant in this country is that on the one hand, you have that family experience oftentimes. Um, but then it's also t oftentimes uh, erased or ignored. Well, uh, I mean, these are all different circumstances yeah. in the Korean uh, Filipino, Spanish, uh, Greek case. I mean, it was suppressed in the home country uh, under dictatorships and military rule and uh, fascist governments and so on, uh, which may adds an extra layer of difficulty to recovering. It has to be recovered in the home country, which is not so easy. It takes time. Right. Right. You, um, you write about uh, the necessity to develop a critical 
comprehension of, her, comprehension of reality. Um, I, I guess part of what um, what's interesting about the Asian American experience is that the experiences are not self-evident, but as people begin to look into their own family histories and their own backgrounds, this is where, is, is that kind of what you mean by that kind of work? Well, it's, yeah, and it's, it's I mean, there are a lot of specific problems in the Asian American case in that, uh, in, in complicated ways, uh, Asia has been, or different parts of Asia, depending on what year it is, are demonized. Uh, in the in the United States to an extreme extent, and this goes way back. It, of course, varies. Depends who the allies are and who the enemies are, but uh, there's kind of a generalized uh, demonization of Asians, which isn't differentiated much in the popular culture, uh, even though it may be in policy, uh, which just affects everyone. You know. On the one hand, there'll be a demonization of the bad Asians, but then there's always some kind of group whether it's uh, Chinese or Chap uh, Japanese Americans or Chinese Americans from one moment to the next, or let's say in South Vietnam, yeah. those who are collaborators and therefore the good yeah, Vietnamese. The yeah. the but you know, I think in the popular, in the general popular culture, these differentiations aren't clear to people. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's important to understand that the United States itself is an extremely insular country. I mean, most people don't know anything about the outside world. And they can't distinguish who you're for and who you're against. I, mean, I, I remember, re, take a recent case, uh, the, the, one of the major wars in the uh, 1980s uh, was Nicaragua. It was a big issue all over the newspapers. You couldn't miss it. Everyone knew it's a huge issue. Well, my wife and I were, uh, went down a number of times. Uh, and our, uh, we had friends, who, people who have college degrees, you know, educated people who assumed that we were visiting the Contras. The reason is that the U.S. supports governments, and they know we're these kind of crazy types with funny ideas, so we must be visiting the guerrillas. Uh, you know, th th this is the lead issue in the newspapers, and they didn't know which side the U.S. government was on. And just imagine if people are, who don't even, you know, barely know where Asia is are trying to sort out who are the friends and who are the enemies. It's, right, right, hmm. absolutely. Um, more recently, uh, there are a lot of Asian American students on campuses. Um, uh, the Stern School of Business at NYU, for example, is 50, 60 percent Asian Americans uh, mm -hmm. in, among their students. Uh, and the representation... Is that from Asia or from the no, United States? Um, Asian Americans? Asian actually. Americans, mm -hmm. many of them 1.5ers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's a popular representation, especially among neoconservatives of Asian Americans as kind of the motto minority, um, used as a way to point to poor African Americans and right. Latinos as, well, these are examples of a, of a, a minority and they've helped themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, um, you know, how would, I mean, how, how would you understand that in the global context that... that <laughs> I, I mean, there are striking differences. Yeah. They, they didn't come from the same experience as uh, Latinos and blacks. Uh, the, uh, and they tend, uh, it's kind of reminiscent of the Jewish minorities, tend to be education-oriented, hardworking, uh, quiet, obedient, and you don't pay attention to the splits within the community. So you know, who goes down to the poor neighborhoods where Asian Americans live? But the ones who make it to uh, NYU do come from a uh, education-oriented, upward-oriented uh, community, so they can be you know, held, as you say, as a kind of weapon against others. Why don't you do it if they do it? Mm -hmm. That's, which puts them in an especially difficult position. For one thing, it's not representative of the Asian American community. Yeah. Well, many of them also come from backgrounds, let's say in Korea, where um, the, the parents actually enjoyed a kind of American-style education mm -hmm. as it was instituted after the war. Yeah. In, in South Korea, same with Japan, same with Taiwan, other places. And um, so in many ways, they're already very comfortable with kind of Western-style uh, mm. education. Um, and oftentimes when they came to this country, they, they sacrificed quite a bit for their children because they were at a higher professional level. And then they end up operating a green grocer in the case of many Korean Americans. Or but your child goes to NYU. Right, yeah, but the child goes to NYU. And that puts a lot of pressure, uh, as you can imagine, um, on the children 
to, uh, because the parents are expressing their love through sacrificing themselves for their children, the children then feel that they need to honor their parents and that love. But at the same time, they feel the need to uh, become a part of American culture, strike out, uh, to strike out, to get mm -hmm. some freedom uh, from that kind of authority. Um, many of these parents are fairly authoritarian, coming from authoritarian uh, governments. Um, and cultures. And cultures, which, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, what would you say? I mean, uh, what would you say to some of these students? Because uh, I can't tell uh, people how to live their lives. I don't give advice to my own children. No. Nah. <laughs> if I did, if I did, they'd be smart enough not to listen. So, it doesn't. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, how? I mean, maybe I should ask it a different way, which is, um, uh, if they're if they're struggling to try to understand uh, some of that themselves, uh, many of them will kind of work it out in terms of this personal you know, kind of animosity or rebellion against their parents. But it seems to me that they've really, they've really come out of a larger historical moment, uh, post-war, post-World War II Asia, wars in Asia. Mm -hmm. And they've got a difficult relationship with this country and this culture in many ways. So. Yeah, that could turn out to be more difficult because the, the conflicts are simmering and could blow up again. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, potential U.S. China conflict is right beneath the surface. Uh, U.S. planners regard China as a serious potential enemy. There's concern that the whole Northeast Asia region might strike out on its own. It's a rich, developing region. Uh, and those uh, are likely to be, uh, they're going to live with those problems very likely. They may take a more serious form. So, so we better figure out ways of resolving them. Mm -hmm. Some economists are projecting that in 2020, China's economy will be the same size as the U.S.'s economy um, if it continues to grow. Uh, obviously, with the SARS incident yeah. recently, that's well. The SARS target. actually, I think one should see as reflecting another sort of hidden problem in China, and that is that the uh, since the uh, reforms, you know, the sort of market reforms have been taking place, uh, the uh, uh, a lot of the social s of the support system has collapsed, so the health system is pretty well gone. Actually, there was recently a study done by a, a Harvard University uh, group and uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, Beijing University, well, some university there, medical school, trying to see if they could give a realistic analysis of growth rates in China mm -hmm. if they took into account the loss of support systems. So if you lose your health support system and you have to deal with it yourself, that's a cost. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, growth declines if you take that in. So they tried, it's a tricky study, but they tried to do an estimate and you know, their figures were not impressive. I mean, it, uh, by their analysis, Chinese growth rates were very low. If you took into account the collapse of uh, pension systems, support systems, health systems, and so on. And I, I strongly, you know, China is so secretive, you can't really figure out what's going on very well, and the statistics are probably very dubious. Uh, but it's uh, very likely, I suspect, that the SARS concerns have to do with uh, the collapse of a preventive health system. I mean, whatever one thinks about Mao's China, uh, it had a pretty successful uh, 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 health outcomes. Actually, there's, it's interesting the way this is dealt with here. Uh, the, the main person who's studied, the economist who studied uh, famines and social policy and their effects is Amartya Sen, won the Nobel Prize for this work, the very important work. Uh, half of his work is known. The other half, which is in the same papers, is not known. Uh, what his main studies, uh, he and his colleague Jean Drez, uh, compared uh, China and India, uh, which is a good comparison. I mean, they both colonized, became independent, same time, late 40s, and they were sim you know, different countries. Large populations. Yeah, and similar in many ways, levels of development and so on. Uh, well, he, uh, uh, he, one of his main contributions was studying the main, the terrible Chinese famine in uh, 1958 to 60, when you know, maybe 20, million people died, big, you know, terrible famine. And he treats that as a, a political crime, basically, an ideological crime. It's not that 
the center wanted to kill people, it's that uh, they didn't get any information. Totalitarian society, you don't get a flow of information up and back and simply didn't know what was happening and uh, no critical commentary and they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, in India, he points out, which is a capitalist democratic society, they uh, did get information. So there were flows of information up and back and criticism and so on. And India never suffered uh, any such famines after the British were kicked out. There were plenty of them before. But uh, since independence, hadn't had a major famine. And this is the well-known part of Amartya Sen's work, shows how awful the communists are. Take a look at the same papers, and the other half of the paper uh, does a different analysis. It compares mortality rates in India and China since independence. Well, in China, they went way down uh, because they instituted rural health programs and barefoot doctors and preventive medicine for the huge, you know, overwhelmingly rural population. In India, they didn't. They followed capitalist principles. You don't do anything for people, do it on their own. Uh, well, it turns out that the uh, death rates in India declined much more slowly. And if you look at the gap, well, I'll just quote their own conclusion. What they say is every eight years, India put as many skeletons in its closet mm -hmm. as China did during its years of shame, mm -hmm. meaning during the period that they studied, 1947 to 1979, that's 100 million extra deaths in India. Uh, well, that's pretty serious. And that's also, they treat that as an ideological crime, too. Mm -hmm. comes from government policies. You, know, you could have carried out preventive medicine and rural health care and so on, but they didn't. Well, that half of the study is unknown, unreported. When Sen got his Nobel Prize, uh, I didn't see a single mention of it. And it's hard to miss. It's in the same papers, you know, in the same books but it doesn't fit the requirement. So that's our ideological crime. It doesn't fit our ideological requirements. Anyway, going back to China, that system has been lost. And in fact, their study, San Andreas, goes a little beyond 79, and they say that at the very beginning of the reform period, 79, the death rate started, the decline slowed. You know, Whether that continues, I don't know. But if these facts are taken into account, get a rather different picture, and I strongly suspect that the SARS epi epidemic has to be looked at in that context. I mean, there is a concern that if it spreads to the countryside where the health support systems have virtually collapsed, there could be a catastrophe. Right. Right. Yeah, part of um, what you're pointing out is that usual um, indicators of, of economic development uh, don't take into account um, mm -hmm people's well-being, health care. Um. I mean, there is an effort was done by uh, Al-Haq and uh, Sen and others to, uh, uh, and it's now part of the UN program to uh, construct an annual human development index, which is different from the growth index. And that it's, it takes into account a few things, like I think uh, literacy, uh, infant mortality, and maybe one or two other things. And if countries are ranked in human development, it looks quite different from uh, uh, economic growth. Right. The growth is a very funny notion. You know, that has much to do with most of the population. Right. Right. And in fact, take Chinese growth. The China, China's growth statistics are very high. But to be serious about it, you have to ask how much of it is foreign-owned growth. Right. Uh, and it turns out, if you look at the real growth areas of China, plenty of it's foreign investment. Overseas Chinese, uh, Japanese, uh, U.S., others. It's also very urban as opposed to more That's very urban and it leaves out most of the population. Right. There's like 900 million people out there who right. may be devastated if uh, the big question now in the world trade system is whether China is going to uh, agree to open its, uh, uh, to open its economy to uh, agricultural mm -hmm. imports from the United States and Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, these are highly subsidized uh, technologically advanced uh, agribusiness exports, which no peasant society can possibly compete with. They don't have the subsidies, they don't have the support, and so on. Right. Uh, so they'll be wiped out. Right. Uh, but that means uh, hundreds of millions of people will be you know, destitute. What happens to them? They'll yeah. become dependent on these well, imports just, just, to the Well, areas, the, yeah. the economy does, but what about the producers? Mm -hmm. And uh, peasant agriculture happens to be highly productive and very effective, but uh, it cannot compete with uh, 
uh, subsidized uh, high-tech uh, agribusiness. It's right. impossible. The same thing's happening in Mexico. Right. The, and in fact, all over the world, you know, peasant communities are being you know, devastated by the fact that they can't, although they may be highly productive, and they are, in fact, very often when scientific agriculture, as it's called, comes into some third world area, uh, production actually declines. Right. Uh, because peasant agriculture, which is the product of uh, centuries or millennia of uh, uh, development, uh, study, uh, you know, uh, selection, I mean, picking the right, d developing seeds and so on and so forth, uh, turns out to be really productive. I mean, people know you know, this seed you plant under this rock right. because the sun hits it in the afternoon and so on and so forth. Right. That's all gone when you have scientific, usually monocrop uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, peasant, the peasant agricultural tradition, though it's very rich, is unknown. Right. The reason it's unknown is it's a, it's, it's a women's culture. It goes from mother mm -hmm. to daughter. So, you know, in, right in the society, people don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the daughter knows what it is because her mother taught her, you know. Uh, and it develops over long periods, extremely rich and extremely fragile. Um, if you eliminate it, it's gone. Well, there's also the move of, let's say, U.S. corporations to take, let's say, certain varieties of basmati rice um, yeah. from local uh, and then to traditions patent them, and patent, patent them, them and for, to modify them slightly, force them back under subsidized exports, right. which destroys the peasant society. Actually, right. sometimes it's more brutal than that. I was in uh, southern Colombia not long ago, uh, where in fact chemical warfare is going on. They call it fumigation, but it's just another form of chemical warfare. And what it's just doing is uh, destroying peasant communities. I mean, it's driving peasants off the land. Mm -hmm. These again are rich, you know, traditional peasant communities with highly complicated and rich uh, agriculture, but it's an extremely fragile system. Mm -hmm. One generation is enough to kill it. Mm -hmm. It's closely connected to the, in Colombia, it turns out, very rich biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So it's all integrated with that. Mm -hmm. But the biodiversity is also being destroyed by right. the chemical warfare and other operations. Mm -hmm. And you know, you drive the peasants off the land by what's called fumigation. Uh, they join the several million people rotting in urban slums. Mm -hmm. uh, mining companies come in and strip mine the mountains once the uh, uh, these are indigenous people, campesinos, Afro-Colombians. Afro uh, once they're away, the mining companies can come in freely, the drilling companies come in, you can put up uh, dams, you know, flooding big areas for hydroelectric power, for, for you know, for what they call free export zones, foreign right. industries, and uh, the peasant society is gone. The, uh, a lot of the biodiversity is destroyed. Uh, you end up with, uh, you know, violent, a tremendous violence, as you'd expect, There's about 20 political assassinations a day by now. Uh, and then, as far as the agricultural areas are concerned, what either they'll turn into ranches for you know cattle raising or right. something, or else uh, monocrop uh, agro-export using uh, Monsanto uh, genetically modified seeds, uh, which will go somewhere. You know. And the creation of shanty towns in and these extended urban areas. Well, you know, areas. if you go out to the urban areas, yeah. it's all. And in fact, the people, it's it's. You know, it's like many countries. I mean, the people, most of the, a lot of the, the wealthier part of the population is completely unaware of it. Yeah. I mean, I've had Colombian students who learned about Colombia when they came here. Right. Uh, and they heard people, you know, like me and others giving talks about it, and they went back and said, oh, yeah, that's the other corner of town. I mean, you know, there's plenty of people in uh, downtown Manhattan. Well, exactly. You know, who don't yeah. know what's going on a mile away. Right, right. What do we know about the homeless? Well, it's not just the homeless, it's the way people live. Yeah. I mean, I've you know, walked through parts of Manhattan which look like the, some of the worst parts of the third world. Yeah. You just don't see them. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, and, uh, the same in Boston, the same everywhere. I mean, my own children you know, uh, didn't see, a, really, a poor person in a serious sense until we happened to take them to Tijuana once. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of shocked. They didn't know people lived like this. Well, in fact, they live like this just a couple of miles away from where we live, but who sees that? Right. Uh, we recently were doing some teach-ins around in Indonesia and, and looking at the, um, obviously, Indonesia is one of the largest, uh, is the largest Islamic you know, nation um, yeah. in, in the world, but also uh, it's clearly a f uh, kind of a, 
an ongoing hotspot in terms of U.S. Uh, conglomerate and global conglomerate interests. So um, there's gas and oil. There's also the natural resources of the forestry um, and their indigenous. Which is, which is a devastating, yeah. and it's being destroyed actually by, mostly by Asian uh, exporters, Thai and others are just wiping out the forest illegally. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for their woods, for the, for the, wood, for the teak yeah. woods and yeah. things like that. And it's, it's illegal. By now. Uh, by now, Indonesia has laws about it, but uh, you know, nobody's enforcing them. Uh -huh. And that can have a turn. Uh, it's kind of like the destruction of the Amazon. You know, it's very dangerous. They're being sowed at Pier 1 and yeah. other places like that in the name of kind of yeah. being able to have middle class access yeah. to luxury yeah, but goods. But there's a kind of a background there, which is also, uh, it's, it's amazing that it, it's, well, it's striking that it's not known here. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the United States' relations to Indonesia are pretty complex. Yeah. Uh, Indonesia was uh, a central focus of U.S. tension back in the late 1940s. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, was, you know, the planning commissions called it the major issue in Asia. In 1958, this is kind of on, I mean, it's public information, but nobody knows it. Right. Uh, the U.S. carried out, the, uh, the Eisenhower administration carried out the uh, largest uh, clandestine subversive operation in post-war history uh, to try to s destroy Indonesia, to break it up, to separate the outer islands. They supported a military revolt to strip the outer islands away from Indonesia. The outer islands were most of the wealthy resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason was that uh, the Indonesian government was becoming too independent, it was a pillar of the non-aligned movement, which the West hated, and also too democratic. Uh, the Indonesian government, though sort of an autocracy, was allowing a political party of the poor uh, to function, and it was picking up support. Now, if you look at the now declassi declassified U.S. records, they were very concerned about that. They thought they were going to get dominant support within a quasi-democratic political system. So therefore, that system had to be destroyed. Uh, and uh, there, were, there was an attempt in 1958 to split it up by force. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. The U.S. then turned to supporting the generals. Uh, by 1965, there was a military coup, Suharto coup, mm -hmm. uh, which killed, uh, no, nobody knows, but maybe a million people in uh, a couple of months, you know, hundreds of thousands, certainly. A huge massacre. Uh, CIA called it the uh, one of the worst mass murders of the 20th century, comparable to Stalin and Hitler. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was greeted with complete, it was reported accurately here, pretty accurately. It was greeted with total euphoria. I mean, uh, the Time magazine had a, an issue which had on the front cover something like boiling bloodbath, and then it just reveled in this wonderful massacre of hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it, mostly landless peasants destroyed the uh, one political party, mass-based political party, and opened the country to uh, foreign robbery foreign investment. Uh, after that, General Suharto ran it, compiled one of the most grotesque human rights records in the world. He was hailed here as a wonderful person. The Clinton administration described him as our kind of guy. They invaded East Timor with enormous U.S. support. Carter administration had since mm -hmm. uh, wiped out maybe a third of the population there. Pretty much suppressed. You know, I mean, you can figure it out if you looked. but. Uh, uh, almost nobody knows. And that goes right on until 1999. Finally, the U.S. Uh, uh, Suharto lost his usefulness. He began dragging his feet on IMF orders, and he was sort of losing control of the population. There was a popular revolt brewing, a lot of it by students, actually a lot of it using the Internet. It's one of the first Internet revolutions because uh, they could communicate around the, you know, the official system. By 1998, the U.S. was giving up on Suharto, and he got a phone call from Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, saying uh, the U.S. believes it's time for a democratic transition. Uh, four hours later, he resigned. You know, it's not cause and effect, but it does reflect the power relations. Uh, try to find some comment here asking why they hadn't had a democratic democratic tradition since 1958. Well, no, that's part of history you wipe out. Why, did, why, why the euphoria about one of the biggest massacres in the, uh, in, in the 20th century, which is incidentally entirely open? You know, it's, uh, well, but you know, 
All of that and what it means is gone. So when you talk about Indonesia, yes, a lot of complicated things. And it's a little like the Philippines. A lot of Indonesians don't know about this. Exactly. Yeah, because there were 100,000 100, political prisoners. You know, the major writers in the country were in prison. They couldn't, nobody could talk about it. You know, it's, uh, and it's, you know, you have to recover your own history and historical understanding and put it in the context of world affairs, which is not so simple. Yeah, uh, part of the pattern of Asians in the U.S. has been when the U.S. is involved in a foreign policy intervention of one kind or another, then, and in some cases it's people who were suppressed and actually are important intellectuals, um, yeah. you know, coming here, but in any case, arriving here and their children settling here and arriving here, and then their children are really cut off from any kind of understanding. Well, they were cut off in their own countries yeah. because of the repressive regimes, sometimes really brutal ones. Yeah. When they come here, they find that history is gone. Right. Uh, they have to recover it. But just like uh, young students here, if they want to understand anything about U.S. history, they're going to have to discover it. It's not going to be taught to them in schools. Right. right. Um, we, we only have about five minutes left, but uh, I, I thought it'd be useful to talk about Wen Holi a little bit in this context, because in many ways he's an example of that. He's yeah. a very successful uh, kind of mono minority in a certain sense who. Who, uh, who came as a foreign student, married here, had children here, became a naturalized citizen, became quite successful, loving mathematics, really, uh, worked on nuclear arms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Los Alamos. But then what happened to him, in some ways, I think has been quite a rude awakening for a lot of professionals, um, uh, Asian Americans in this country. Um, so that, yeah, well, yeah. you know, these f f racist and other factors yeah. and often intermingled with uh, political Internet, international political conflict are right below the surface. Doesn't take much for them to emerge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, look, uh, there, I, I wouldn't be, if the, let's take a, a hypothetical situation closer to me personally. If the United States turned against Israel, which it could, there could be a major wave of anti Semitism in the United States. Mm -hmm. It hasn't existed for maybe 30 years, but 40 years, but it could come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ju all these things are barely below the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, when the U.S. spy plane got shot over at China, yeah. all of a sudden in this country there were yeah, calls for boycotts of Walmart because they're selling goods made from China yeah. and boycotts of Chinese restaurants. And, well, you know, and yeah. suppose that China does begin to take what looks like an independent course. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of concern. I mean, U.S. military planning is oriented towards uh, a potential Chinese threat. So what's called missile defense, which has nothing to do with defense. Uh, but it's understood by both the Chinese and by the U.S. Uh, to be a first strike weapon aimed at China, not anybody else. Yeah, and of course, part of the concern, I mean, even if, let's say, Chinese Americans were uh, pro-U.S. and, and didn't Whatever care about, uh, yeah. yeah. Pro -U what does pro-U.S. mean? I mean, Inter like, I'm pro-U.S., but against the U.S. government, right. you know, it's, uh, Depends what you mean. Think U.S. is right. Is it the population? Is it the culture of the society? Um, state policy? You know, it's a very interesting concept. It's a, it's really has totalitarian roots. This whole concept of um, anti-American or pro-U.S. and so on. It uh, it presupposes that the society, the culture, and its people should be identified with state policy, right. uh, and that's something that should be you know, dismantled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pro-U.S. is too much. I don't like to use it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, uh, you know, a, a, there are a lot of Asian Americans who really come out of more kind of conservative backgrounds. So mm -hmm. they're supporting U.S. foreign policy, and but they find the contradiction when they're here in terms of they're being entirely vulnerable to. Yeah. Uh, to racism, but also uh, feeling quite vulnerable. I mean, many Chinese Americans believe that if there was a war with China or China was declared an axis yeah, of they evil, could be they would be interned, yeah, yeah. And just like the Japanese Americans, yeah. yeah. It's not impossible. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not going to duplicate it, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the um, hysteria over China has been extreme. Uh, the red Chinese were the super demons in the 1950s. Uh, all kind of fantasies concocted about uh, what they're planning to do to Americans, you know, uh, turn them into drug addicts. Uh, that particular thing was particularly ironic because it's the West that turned China into drug addicts by force, but right. that's been forgotten. 
Uh, now there were fantasies about them going to turn us into drug addicts. And that could easily come back, just like the stories about uh, Hispanic narco traffickers were stimulated and built up in the late uh, 80s, uh, you know, mostly for domestic and international political reasons. And it doesn't take long. You know? And these populations are very susceptible to that kind of propaganda. Yeah. It's, it's worth bearing in mind that the, for whatever reason, I don't know what the reason is, we can speculate, but the United States happens to be a very frightened society and has been for a long time. Uh, I mean, actually, it goes back to colonial history, but uh, in the modern period, it's dramatic. I mean, I remember my own children uh, in uh, school back around the early 60s being taught to uh, hide under desks. Tuck and cover, them, yeah. Protect themselves from atom bombs, which are going to come from China, probably, or Russia, or someplace. Mm. Uh, there's no other, I don't think there's any other country in the world where any kind of such lunacy took place. But it's a strain that runs right through the culture and is always barely below the surface. It's a large part of the gun culture is based on that. I mean, plenty of people really think they need guns to protect themselves right. from. And you should see who they're protecting themselves from. I mean, there are parts of the country where people are protecting themselves from uh, the United Nations, uh, which is sending black helicopters over to carry out their plans of the genocide of Americans right. or aliens. You know, this fear of aliens. And of course, uh, communists, whoever the current enemy happens to be. But these are strains that are just beneath the surface, and they can show up in very ugly ways. Right. Okay, we're going to need to wrap up this segment, um, but uh, we wanted to open up for questions and um, and comments. Uh, so. Um. Uh, name is Charles Ellinger. I wanted to ask if you could expand on two things in China. One being, uh, I understand that while there's a, a rapid growth, it's going to uh, investors and the Communist Party operatives, but not so much to the peasants, to the extent that I've been told that uh, there have been some physical uprisings in the country, and that it might actually be a forebearer of a revolution. This is according to a group called China Study in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then the other question would be, uh, uh, our move into Afghanistan, and uh, it seems to be people say we're trying to uh, control oil and perhaps other resources in that area. Where does China fit in as far as its needs for oil? Does it have its own support, or will it be possibly uh, a problem with America over control of that area? Uh, well, what's going on in the interior of China, people really don't know much about. But there have been reports, I mean, there is. I mean, there have been you know, some speculation that China might go back to uh, a period of mass uh, uh, peasant revolts, uh, mass peasant revolts against the central authority. That's a large part of tr Chinese history. You know, it's uh, quite big ones. Uh, it's conceivable because the peasant population is in a serious situation. A lot of people are being driven off the land already. Uh, they're becoming highly exploited labor in very ugly circumstances in the uh, growth areas, the industrial areas, which are split. Um, Chinese growth has benefited a large part of the population, uh, but it has also uh, uh, devastated a very large part, too. And uh, how this is going to play out, nobody knows. The big effect is likely if they open themselves up to uh, agri-export from the West, the United States and Europe, that could lead to a very serious problem. And this decline of support services could be pretty severe, too. So I don't think these speculations are wild. We don't know, but they could be happening. Actually, China has been carrying out quite repressive policies in many areas, in, and this gets to Afghanistan, including the Muslim areas uh, in, the, uh, in Western China, where there were connections to things happening in Central Asia, even people moving up and back. And that uh, repression, which is pretty severe, uh, has been supported by the United States since September 11th. Um, September 11th gave a kind of a, uh, gave a free reign to repressive governments all around the world to become more repressive. So Russia and Chechnya, China and Western China, with authorization from Washington, now they call it counterterrorism. But that actually is a link. I mean, China was involved in Afghanistan, China and Iran, uh, were involved in the 70s against the domestic, more or less by the late 70s, Russian-backed government. 
as part of their whole you know international uh, games uh, even before the US got in seriously this sort of like late 70s uh, and the connections have continued China has great interests in Central Asia naturally borders on them uh, and the the, the uh, oil, uh, energy sources are a crucial issue the US has always since the Second World War uh, committed itself to controlling Middle East oil because it's the main resource in the world and it's kind of a lever of world control. On the other hand, uh, eastern uh, Siberia has a substantial, mainly gas, but also oil resources, which China needs. Uh, and uh, so does South Korea. That's uh, a large part of the North Korean problem is that it's right in the middle of all of this. These areas, uh, Russia, because of its eastern Siberian resources, China, big developing society, with resources of its own, uh, Japan and South Korea, huge industrial countries, they're all integrated. And they could, uh, the resources of the area could yield a degree of independence, maybe high independence. Uh, then comes the question of who picks up uh, you know, the Central Asian resources, which are not on the scale of the Persian Gulf, but are substantial. So yes, this is, uh, these are major concerns for planners and could be large parts of future evolving policy. Uh, it's only as far as Afghanistan is concerned, I mean, the U.S. didn't go in there because it wants oil. There's nothing much in Afghanistan. You know, they could use a pipeline, but it's a secondary issue. I think too much was made of that. Uh, the U.S. does want military bases there and also in Central Asia, but that's because of Central Asia and the Persian Gulf. It seems a, a common theme um, in a, an oppressive situation, whether it's in a family <clears throat> or whether in a society, is the, the power of silence. Um, certainly in a family unit, if there's some type of abuse going on or whatever, the, there's that strong network of, of keeping people quiet. And then it, it spills out. Could you talk about the power of silence a little bit? Is that from humanness? Is that from a societal thing? Where does that come from? Well, it certainly is pervasive. I mean, the domestic abuse issue is a remarkable example of it. I mean, I, hap I didn't myself, I didn't know anything much about it until very recently, but happened to have learned about it, and I've just been shocked by what I've discovered. I mean, in my own town, which is a uh, you know, professional, educated, relatively wealthy town, everybody's it turns out, I, I've often wondered what the police do in that town. There's nothing to do except chase lost cats or prevent uh, black kids from coming in uh, in a dilapidated car. They're kind of like a border police. Uh, but it turns out that uh, they have uh, two or three uh, cases a week where they're actually called to, you know, by a 911 call that gets them to a home for domestic abuse cases. I would have never guessed that this could have happened here. And yes, it's silenced. Uh, and it's silenced within families. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's silenced among friends. Uh, I mean, I have a close friend who happens to be a radical woman lawyer uh, who works in a radical law office, a lot of it on feminist issues. Uh, one of her colleagues was coming in bruised, and they suspected that some problems taking place, but she had nothing. She was killed. You know, so right in the middle of the most you know, sophisticated, uh, conscious area. And I tell you, I can remember that from childhood, too. As we said, I was in an immigrant community. Uh, we happened to be the only Jewish family in a mostly Irish and German Catholic neighborhood. It was in the 1930s. Very anti-Semitic. Uh, street life for myself and my younger brother, two Jewish boys, was a tricky issue, you know, because, because the anti-Semitism was extreme. Uh, we never told our parents about it. I don't think our parents ever knew till, their, till they died, and they never knew what the life was like in our own neighborhood. You just didn't talk to your parents about those things, and they didn't talk to you about things. And, uh, uh, and this is inside families, you know, closely knit families, when you go beyond well, you know, the things we've been talking about, silence about uh, crimes, uh, stories that aren't ideologically acceptable and so on, it's overwhelming. In fact, one of the, well, as you know, when the women's movement 
began in serious, uh, a serious way in the late 60s, early 70s. A lot of it was just uh, telling the truth about ourselves. Yes. You know, let's face the truth about our own lives because we've been silent about it. This is, we, nobody talked about it. It's just you accept it as the norm. If you bring out what actually, what your life is actually like to yourself, you know, uh, it's, it can be revolutionary. Uh, we, we only have uh, just a, a minute left, um, unfortunately, but um, one of the quotes that you refer to is John Dewey um, in your miseducation book, and I'll just read it. The ultimate aim of production is not production of goals, uh, or goods, I'm sorry, but the production of free human beings associated with one another on terms of equality. Um, could you just maybe end with a few comments about that? Well, John Dewey, who was the leading American social philosopher, was also, by our standards, pretty radical. I mean, he, uh, I think his position is correct. Uh, Bertrand Russell took very similar positions. And yes, a decent education uh, ought to be creating free, independent, uh, creative human beings. It doesn't have to be developing them. It has to be allowing them to follow those natural instincts. Those are natural among children. The educational system has to beat it out of them and make them obedient and subordinate and so on. But a decent educational system would be would allow these natural uh, aspects of human nature to flourish and encourage them. And it would be part of developing a free and democratic society of real participation. But of course, that runs counter to elite interests. Uh, the, uh, it's worth remembering that the United States was not founded to be a democratic society. And elites do not want it to be a democratic society. It's supposed to be what uh, political scientists sometimes call a polyarchy, a system basically of elite decision and public um, ratification. And if you had a, the kind of um, educational system that Dewey spent his life committed to, you wouldn't be able to sustain that. Uh, people would become active, involved, engaged, and would try to create a truly functioning democratic society, which would, as Dewey also pointed out, require uh, uh, industrial democracy. That means democratizing uh, production, uh, mm -hmm. commerce, and so on, which means eliminating the whole structure of capitalist hierarchy. Mm -hmm. His positions were, well, I mean, he's very main, you know, real Main Street America, but uh, radical from the point of view of prevailing doctrine. And I think he's quite right about that. In fact, uh, just to go to politics, uh, Dewey also pointed out that until that's done, unless that's done, politics will remain what he called the shadow cast by business over society. And the educational system will be a system of indoctrination and control. Uh, I was lucky as a kid to be sent to a Deweyite school. And it was quite, a, quite an exciting experience. On, on, on that note, we have to wrap up. But uh, thank you very much. This is very